Yeah. Okay, so Oliver and I, we're going to show you quickly what we experienced in the last maybe five years in Chicago. And we're going to show you the city of derivatives. What can you see in the city of derivatives? So you see here Chicago, and Chicago is a city of great social differences and contradictions. Here you can see a cocktail reception at the Art Institute by the Futures and Op Options Expo and the American Mortgage Association, which had the motto at this time, hitting bumps but moving forward. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good motto. Yeah, great. <laughs> so this is a view from the taxi on LaSalle Street towards the Chicago Board of Trade. And here you can get a glimpse at the financial district seen from the Willis Tower. Ceres sits atop of the Chicago Board of Trade. Ceres is the goddess of agriculture, grain crops, fertility, and motherly re relationships. This is the north entrance of the Chicago Board of Trade at uh, Jackson Boulevard. And this is the inside of the Chicago Board of Trade. Here you can see the futures and the option market at the Chicago Board of Trade. And uh, here you can see the plan of the, or kind of an overview of the futures and option market. We always were reminded that it almost looks like a circuit diagram. Mm -hmm. um, and you can see here, and just find the cursor. So you have here the euro dollar futures market, the option dollar, op, uh, the euro dollar options market, and for example. The futures market is closed already, so this market completely exists as an electronic market. And um, here you can see the S&P 500 options market next to the futures market. And what you also can see um, is that those markets or this kind of architecture still follows a logic, or a physical logic, a phys physical closeness. Um, which the electronic market doesn't need anymore. And here, I think it's a nice image to show you the hybrid system of um, electronic communication and the open outcry. Uh, so open outcry, I, I guess everyone is familiar with it, is based on human interaction, predominantly um, male humans. <laughs> <laughs> so here's the euro dollar market from a different perspective. And this is the euro dollar market after closing. <laughs> <laughs> You're so right. <laughs> At the Chicago Board of Trade, the interface becomes environment. We always had the feeling you find yourself inside the machine, inside the computer. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we found evidences of self-reflection. <laughs> <laughs> it's not fun. <laughs> and um, here's the next plan of the grain market, which is traditionally the older market, <coughs> but this trading floor uh, next to the financial derivatives has closed as an open outcry market two years ago, and all trades are done now electronically. So. This image, for example, so this doesn't exist anymore. 2015, the CME Group announced that they will close 90% of their futures trading pits, 90% uh, of the open outcry. Mm -hmm. So we heard the lease of the CBOT building is expiring in 2017, and most of the traders, they speculate um, that you know the entire open outcry will cease to exist at that time. 
the markets have migrated then to electronic plat platforms like Globex, CME Group. Karin Knorr writes, the scopic regime under which electronic financial markets operate right now could simply migrate underground completely. So we found those images always very interesting. Um, here you can see one image of a trader workspace from 1987 by um, Tom Petrillo. And you can see that um, he still has his family in his frame on the desktop. And the image we shot in 2011, I don't know if you can see that, uh, the trader replaced the family with the open outcry. <laughs> So this is what uh, a contemporary electronic market looks like uh, today, in particular, uh, in this instance, a high frequency trading uh, floor. So on the left side, you see the developers and the programmers uh, back to back with the traders on the right side. In this setup, the trader is completely immersed in the screens and oversees the activity of the algorithmic program structure in the market. That's a workspace of an analyst. Electronic trading accelerated the globalization. It synchronized the global markets. And um, I think it's around 60 to 70 percent of the trading decisions are not ex executed anymore by humans, um, but by algorithms. Maybe by now it's even more. What percent? 60 to 70. So the algorithmic trading allows for extremely fast trades, far exceeding the human perception. In high frequency trading, the unit today is the microsecond. So, and here we are looking at the cover of a report commissioned by the SEC, the US Securities and Exchange Commission. It's on the desk of one of the very traders who were involved in what was coined the flash crash of 2010. But I think we're going to hear a little bit more about it tomorrow from Karin. Um, the flash crash was, uh, or the trash flash, <laughs> the flash crash was the biggest intraday trading drop ever, erasing one million dollars within 20 minutes in market value before regaining much of the lost ground. So the actual loss is estimated around 200 million dollars. Um, but again, Karen, I think we'll talk about that. <coughs> so uh, one of the companies we visited a couple of times, um, the, it's located in the heart of Chicago in the financial district, and they have around 50 employees and make an annual revenue of $11 billion. Here's the massage room of a trading company, which keeps two masseuses on staff during the trading day. And the three elements here are the temporal synchronicity, the race of improved code, and the desire. I don't know, can everyone read what's, yeah. what makes it says? Makes you feel sexy? Yes. yes. <laughs> what makes you feel sexy? That's a good question. Oh. <laughs> it's maybe for everyone different, right? <laughs> so this is the view of, you know, from the perspective from an electronic trading floor onto the city. And uh, quickly, I um, want to show, uh, this is a data center. It's um, a server of the Center for Research and Security Prices, CRISP, also located in downtown um, in the financial, downtown Chicago in the financial district. What is uninterruptible power supply? Yeah. You can't interrupt it. Well, apparently, I mean, I, well, they have a, there's a backup which is in, um, uh, in 
Colorado, and there's a high security sort of backup of all those uh, data. Uh, data. Um, but they claim that this, but it's geologically really not sound where this is because it's uh, that can easily be disrupted actually uh, because uh, of the back rub, the back up, the back rub, and <laughs> sorry, um, <laughs> they um, can make that statement, I guess. And they have a generator on the building. Well, yeah, well, yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah, so everything is highly really. secure. Uh, so Chris collects historical stock market data back to 1914. It maintains some of the largest and most comprehensive propriety <coughs> historical databases in stock market research. So some of the most important figures on the financial industry like Fisher Black, Myron Scholz and also Eugene Farmer <coughs> use this data bank as an empirical backbone for their financial models which gave way to the proliferation of electronic, electronic, electronic trading. And um, here with this small little thing, we want to show you how, so this is what the technosphere sounds like. Oops. This is one image we found in the foyer of the Chicago Board of Trade, and you can read this. This is where the world comes mm -hmm. to manage risk, and whose risk it is the world comes to manage here. I, I think Brian will try to explain us now. Thank you. Oh.